As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be. Because time is always now. Welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, the podcast about the stuff we wonder about and other things. All right, and we are back at it again with alchemist, DJ, engineer, Tesla coiler, and all-around entrepreneur, Warren G. Glad to have you back, Warren. I'm very stoked to be getting into this subject matter with you. Every now and then, I'll see your posts online and I notice in between your alchemical work or your other design projects you got going on, you're consistently reading a book called The Evolution of Matter. And I'm like, oh shit, this is awesome. He's really into it. <laughs> this is a book that was recommended to me by Eric Dollard, which is some people may be familiar with. He dropped a note on that book at one point. But yeah, I think it takes a very rare kind of human these days to be actively pursuing this technical scientific knowledge about the nature of radioactivity, photonuclear reactions, and the physics of the ether. So it's pretty awesome. And yeah, we'll be getting into all of that. But first, we got to start with one of the most fascinating, inspirational, and captivating minds to have ever walked the planet Earth, as far as I'm concerned. Nikola Tesla. Tesla with his ray of discovery. So basically the story of Tesla is the greatest story never told or rarely told. But yeah. So Tesla he was involved with, you know, not just simple matters of electrical power, but basically his discovery of cosmic rays led to his studies into radio power and ionospheric power, earth resonance, solar power fields. Uh, work with ELFs or extra low frequencies, interplanetary communications, all kinds of groundbreaking technologies. And when I say groundbreaking, I can actually mean that literally, <laughs> with that being able to trigger earthquakes and whatnot. But yeah, so let's get into it, man. Tell us a little bit more about Tesla um, and who he was and what he was up to and uh, what, what had Tesla discovered that was of great significance in your mind? Yeah, thanks for having me back on on the podcast. <clears throat> so Nikola Tesla uh, discovered a lot of different things, um, but he was really fascinated with the inner vibrations of the Earth, and he really experimented with uh, high frequency um, electricity and high voltage. So you know, he invented the the AC motor, which is probably the biggest thing that he did that changed the entire world um, forever because that's all the motors that we use for power um, and because of that AC motor he was able to distribute power with power lines and so that's why we have all these these power lines um, but then soon after that he started talking about his high frequency apparatus that he said was way better than anything with alternating current with his AC generators. He actually spoke, I believe it was in Paris, and they're celebrating the installment of one of his generators, and he goes up on stage and tells people to stop clapping and stop celebrating because there's much more work to do. <laughs> and everyone kind of, you know, put a damper on the whole party. Um, but <clears throat> he was really interested in high-frequency high voltage electricity for distributing power and you know we we don't have that uh, type of technology yet today we still use the AC power systems <clears throat> so you know past what we know of Tesla as far as you know AC power systems and you know how greatly that impacted the world as we know it I believe he had a lot of other ideas um, that he wanted to give out, but sadly, I, I think you know the oil industry and power companies got really involved early on, and that had a lot to do with money and funding because Nikola Tesla wasn't a rich person. He was, uh, you know, he was an inventor and didn't really have a lot of like spending money, or at least you know as much as he would like to have. So. You know, he was building the uh, Wardenclyffe Tower, 
and that was supposed to be a system. Uh, it's basically like a modern day cell tower almost, except for it transmitted through the earth instead of through the air. Um, and that was another thing that Tesla kind of, uh, you know, figured out and paved the way for people to understand, but we still don't even really learn about anything about high frequency electricity and its actions through the earth. And also, um, you know, a lot of it had to do with high frequency electricity is the same thing that comes off a lightning strike or a spark. There's a bunch of high frequency harmonics. Um, so, I mean, in the sense of what he's given to the world and, you know, what I think he was trying to say um, as far as better, more advanced ways to power things, um, it was going to be through the ground, uh, through basically a longitud longitudinal wave. And that was one of the things he talked about in his Colorado Springs notebook. He's talking about how he built this apparatus. And it's basically a, somewhat of a Tesla coil attached to um, uh, what he called a receiver. But back then it was kind of like a, a little bell in a sense. <clears throat> and so he tuned the receiver to this, this storm outside Colorado Springs. And he tuned it so that every time the lightning would strike, his receiver would go off. And... As the storm moved away, he found out that it kind of disappeared where he couldn't sense the storm. And about 28 minutes later, he could sense the storm again, <clears throat> but it was farther away. And so, again, it went away. And then 20 minutes later, he was getting a signal again. And so that was his discovery of longitudinal waves that he based all his wireless technology off of. And I mean, that I'd say is probably his, his biggest contribution. Um, however, we don't have a lot of resources to learn about this longitudinal wave because it, you know, it's supposed to be going faster than the speed of light. Um, it's instantaneous. And so, you know, Eric Dollard's touched on similar concepts um, with longitudinal waves and how they travel. Um, but, you know, that is just kind of the, the doorway into what I perceive as a, a whole, you know, just a lot of different concepts that we don't study in school yet, um, just because they're non-physical, which uh, is kind of what the, the ether is based on. Definitely. Now, are these, are these longitudinal waves um, telluric currents themselves, or are telluric currents basically something that Tesla was harnessing for energy and then converting into longitudinal waves in some way, or what's up with that? So, you know, I went to school for electrical engineering. <clears throat> and before I went to school for electrical engineering, I would read a lot of stuff on the internet. And, you know, I was able to build uh, a small Tesla magnifier uh, when I was in college. Um, and bring it in, but uh, some of the concepts or words I use, you know, most people aren't going to understand. So, like, telluric current, you know, is one of those kind of fancy terms that most electrical engineers aren't going to really understand what that means. And there's definitely a lot of different, I don't know, just things on the internet talking about, you know, what Tesla was doing. Um, but in a sense, there's transverse and longitudinal waves and a teller current, I think is kind of like that earth wave, but, um, it's technically not a real term in my opinion. <laughs> now, how does, how does all this stuff, I mean, you know, a lot of people they hear Tesla and they think free energy. Um, how does this kind of tie into the idea of free energy and maybe you could elaborate on what the layman kind of thinks uh, the term free energy means and what impression that you know they have versus what tesla conceptualized free energy as yeah totally and the point i'm kind of trying to make is 
you know, sadly, there's a lot of speculation about what Tesla was doing. And sadly, a lot of kind of uneducated people um, within electrical knowledge kind of try and figure things out. And that's awesome, but it just leads to, you know, some words that are kind of made up. Um, In the sense of what free energy is, um, you know, according to the Colorado Springs Notebook, as written by Nikola Tesla, um, he viewed it as a way of hooking up to the wheel work of nature. Um, most of what he was thinking about was water turbines, um, because the wheel work of nature was, you know, nature's natural, natural ability to evaporate water from lakes, um, at lower elevations where it gets hot. And then that water comes up and hits the mountains where it's colder and has something to condense on, you get snow and rain, and that water comes down the mountain in the form of, you know, a waterfall where you can hook a turbine to, Um, and that water is going to keep going down, and it's going to evaporate. That same idea is also really present in alchemy as far as uh, what they called circulation. It was a way of mimicking nature, and coincidentally, it also has a lot to do with kind of how Tesla was viewing free energy. Um, but most of what he was thinking is, you know, associated with water turbines in that sense. Um, a lot of what he also said is uh, kind of used an analogy. Um, water also has the same characteristics as electricity um, in terms of uh, like the equations that operate it. So pressure and um volume basically fluids act really similar to how electricity flows through wires um which is definitely an interesting similarity definitely yeah and it's so interesting man because you know we think of tesla as you know he was into electricity but i think you know, basically electricity is just a manifestation of the luminiferous ether as tesla would say and the way i understand it uh the various forms of energy and matter and thought are all derived from the ether and tesla essentially was tapping into that very deeply um so yeah there's so much fascinating history so you know after pissing off jp morgan basically and then being ridiculed by the owned media of the day tesla went off and you know privately built what was called uh, a space-powered receiver in Manhattan hotel room at one point, which was viewed by a number of people, I guess, including uh, Dr. Lita Forrest, the inventor of the Audion tube, I learned, which was really kind of fascinating. And I guess this receiver was compact and powered by vacuum tubes that fit within a couple briefcases that he had the ability to insert into an electric car to power it or something along those lines. Pretty nuts stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, so there was alleged evidence that he was constructing and designing appliances that um, made to directly transmit thoughts and images and visions and as well and just different various forms of intelligence that one was supposedly supposedly able to receive them by standing in front of the screen of receptivity and is apparently working on a process to photograph thought as well. So I wanted to get your thoughts on this. What do you think about that? Do you think that means like an image of electrical impulses that make up a thought? Or how do you think that was all gone down? Well, so... You know, this, I guess my answer is kind of going to touch on the free energy concept. <clears throat> you know, he talked a lot about the wheel work of nature um, and gave examples of like waterfalls and water. Um, when you get into the, like the more just like deep stuff with Tesla, when he started doing his high frequency electricity experiments, um, you know, one of the things that he obsessed uh, about in his uh, – Colorado Springs notebook is he started putting different sized uh, like objects on top of his Tesla coil and finding out that they all had a very small change in capacitance. 
um, which also dictated its frequency. And so he started getting into like trying to figure out what frequency everything, like any little object, big objects. Um, he almost, you know, I'd say is, was obsessive about it. But um, because of that, you know, I think a lot of different ideas kind of sprung. You know, I, I don't know how much of it was actually built and like, you know, shown to the public, as you're saying, you know, there's some people who supposedly saw this device. Um, but a lot of, you know, his work with free energy and, you know, the waterfall kind of idea is that there could also be an etheric waterfall um, to some degree. And, you know, that's not something that's not proven. Um, there's definitely a, a lot of different cosmic rays and different frequencies. Um, and within those frequencies, there's also the frequencies of our minds and our brains um, and the frequencies of, you know, potentially feelings. There's all sorts of stuff we know about the brain and different frequencies. Um, so I wouldn't doubt that Tesla could come up with something like that. But, you know, everything is really based on some form of, you know, radiation. And like I said, Tesla was working with high frequency um, but as you mentioned, the ELF range, extremely low frequency, um, which is like, you know, I'd say like 10,000 to like a hundred thousand Hertz. Um, it's, that's probably not exact, but that's a lot of the frequencies that he was um, messing around with. Um, he supposedly said, you know, frequencies below a hundred thousand Hertz. Uh, or 100 kilohertz were the best for transmitting through the earth. Um, you know, and he was also, you know, one of his tricks was he would uh, tune a coil to his body. And so he'd walk around in the room and hold a light bulb and the light bulb would light up. And if he gave it to somebody else, it wouldn't light up because the coil wasn't tuned to that person's body. Um, so, you know, he, he came up with a lot of really interesting things in that Ooh, realm, yeah. but I don't have any personal experience with those. Sorry. Sorry. Um, how do you, do you have any idea of how he would go about tuning that to his own body or anybody's body for that matter? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, it's really, it's, it's all capacitance and inductance. Um, and so <laughs> First Tesla explain what capacitance and inductance are? <laughs> yeah, so uh, a Tesla coil is basically a, a huge coil of wire, right? And, um, you know, a lot of people will see the classical Tesla coil that's longer than it is wide by um, a pretty decent ratio. So you have these skinny coils. Um, when you have a wire laid down next to another wire going in the same direction, um, there's something that builds up between the wires uh, in the form of magnetism and that magnetism has an inductance, um, or kind of a, uh, it's, it's like a, a spring essentially. So <clears throat> if you have a coiled spring, the vibration that you see in the spring when you flick it is similar to how the vibration electronically happens when you hit it with a spark. So hitting it with a spark is similar to like banging a bell and, the more inductance that the coil has, the, I guess, longer it's going to resonate. Um, it's like the heavier the bell is, in a sense. And then the capacitance is due to its surface area. So that's why typically a, a Tesla coil has a huge toroid, or like those big aluminum spheres on top. And that's to give the end of the coil a lot of surface area because it's actually also radiating these lines of force um, through the air touching the ground. And so the coil is kind of like this electric bell in a sense, and based on its capacitance and inductance dictates the frequency it resonates at and how long it's going to resonate for. Um, and that's just, uh, you know, the number of turns on the coil and how big the toroid is. Um, it's like the most basic way to uh, kind of say that. Wow. Okay. okay. So then with that said, um, was he kind of able to, to 
detect or measure the own capacitance of his own body in some way? Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, like I said, he started measuring, like, all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's kind of how he found out what the capacitance of the Earth was and based a lot of uh, his experiments and, you know, ideas and theories on. Um, but, yeah, you could, you know, build a coil. Uh, he said he got so good at building coils that he could just, like, twist a bunch of wire around something and know about what frequency it, it fre resonated at just by doing it because um, he had done it so much. So, uh, you know, that kind of OCD behavior that some of the new movies about Nikola Tesla portray, you know, I could see being true because some of the stuff in his notebook is pretty obsessive. Um, but yeah, tuning it, you know, you could have different uh, numbers of uh, windings and you could take windings off to change the frequency of it, keep the capacitance the same. Um, but yeah, he was he was really uh, interested in measuring all kinds of things. Wow, that's fascinating. And yeah, uh, just a, a couple notes on that. Those ELF waves too. Um, I, I was listening to an old audio recording put up. I think it was by Borderland Research Labs. Um, there's an interesting mention in relation to a weaponized application of Tesla's technologies. I'm not actually sure. I think it was utilize, utilizing ELF waves, um, but it was talking about the impressment of germ frequencies on a population through the use of modified psychotronic transmitter stations. And I was just like, holy shit, I could actually kind of see how that would be possible with you know his understanding of all this different technology. And then there was, there was also a mention of a, a Russian woodpecker or the Soviet buzzsaw. These weapons utilize the ELF waves basically as a behavioral modification weapon of manipulation. And, and then also, I guess, um, these same waves were used by a French physicist to essentially create like death beams that were powerful enough to kill birds or cattle. Crazy shit. And so, yeah, I could understand uh, why, to some extent, this information would be classified for you know purposes of national security or whatever but then again the reverse could also be true because like anything it could be used for good or bad i mean i think this te technology may have unfortunately found itself in the wrong hands already <laughs> and if not the same definitely identical manifestations of these technologies are in action today you look at companies like I think it's M MBDA Systems, Boeing, um, Rain Metal Defense, and, you know, what they're up to in terms of the direct energy weapon development and the information that's publicly available. It's, it's very telling. So what are your thoughts on, on that? I mean, do you see this kind of suppression aspect as helpful or a harmful tactic in, in terms of uh, innovation and, you know, just the evolution of society overall? Or what do you think about that? Yeah, I would say that the problem isn't the technology. Um, you know, it's it's more so, uh, you know, in, in terms of philosophy, um, you know, a, a lot of what we value is based on what we um see as ourselves and so you know like for example back in the day um people used to do with uh what they would think was pious or what the gods wanted um which led to them doing a lot of pretty messed up stuff um you know cutting people's heads off doing human sacrifices you know you name it um when people did stuff in the name of you know whatever god you know a lot of a lot of stuff happened um and, you know, now we're at a point where we do things because we've figured out that people should be valued based on how much they work. Um, and so a lot of the resources that we have are, you know, given to us based on how much we work. And, you know, I'd say that the problem with free energy is how do you tell somebody that you know, how, how does everybody become okay with everybody having energy for free? You know, like 
there'd be a huge change in what you would work for. You know, how much of what you work for is to buy gasoline or electricity, um, you know, or propane or whatever you need, you know, wood almost, you know, as a type of energy, um, you know, or you need something to burn. So to change that whole perspective, you know, we're also talking about changing the, the philosophical mindset of people in terms of what they think they're valued as. And then to introduce a concept where everyone has free energy. I mean, you could grow all your own food pretty easily with, you know, lights in a greenhouse. You could go wherever you wanted to. Um, you know, you could drive to Alaska and, you know, you could drive as far as you wanted to. You wouldn't ever have to pay for gasoline. Um, and you could ferment, you know, or distill or, you know, do as much as you wanted to in terms of like heating and cooling power, um, which is also a huge industry. So there's just a lot of big, you know, issues in terms of its impact on society as we know it. You know, every single car has been made to run on some form of gasoline. And even past that, there's cars you know, that were running off different fuels that have been totally suppressed. Um, so, I mean, a, a lot of it is suppression from, you know, I think kind of stupid people. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's also something that we have built as humankind. We've built a construct and an infrastructure that we're completely dependent on. And, you know, I, I don't know who's going to work. Uh, hold on a sec. Absolutely. Um, and I, I want to get into cloud chambers too. Uh, but before we do that, uh, is there any other important notes you wanted to touch on in regards to high frequency and high voltage currents? Um, I guess something that's just important to keep in mind when it comes to like high frequency stuff, you know, low frequency, um, 60 hertz is what comes out the wall. Uh, current is what kills you, and current goes through your heart. That's typically what kills you. Um, when you're dealing with high frequency, uh, there's something called the skin effect. So a lot of high frequency electricity, when you get past, uh, I believe, 2,000 hertz, the electricity can still like really hurt you, but you can't die from it if it's above 2,000 hertz. 2000 Hertz. And so if you keep going up, you get to the point where the electricity actually goes through the dirt or it travels on the surface of whatever it is. And it's resistance, you know, starts to become less and less to the point where these waves could travel through, you know, water. Um, you know, you'll see videos like that, but it, it can travel through anything that has a, a really high resistance. It, it turns, you know, almost air into um, a conductor at high frequencies. So that's kind of the big difference um, between the electricity that comes out the wall and what Tesla wanted to use. It was both safer and it was almost like naturally there. It's exactly what happens when lightning hits the earth. Okay. Okay. So there is this interesting little invention called the cloud chamber. Um, and that, that plays a big role in all of this as well. Uh, what in the world is a cloud chamber? What, what experiments have been done with these things? Um, and what do they demonstrate? So, you know, back in the day, there's this idea of the ether, which consisted of basically heat, electricity, and light. Um, anything that could change the physical nature of something um and we didn't know what was in between the physical nature and the like etheric nature we'll we'll call it um you know now today we kind of know it as the electric nature um but so you know before people knew what uh radioactivity was um they were solely seeing it based on observation in math or like in something else. They couldn't, no one could actually see 
any type of radiation. So, you know, they found these rocks and they basically found out that if you take the rocks and you put them in between a capacitor, um, like two high voltage electrodes and certain rocks would actually discharge the electrodes without the electrodes touching. All you do is put the rock in between it. And so <clears throat> that's how they first kind of started measuring radioactivity um, based on how fast it could discharge a capacitor through the air. Um, Tesla, you know, basically made these huge Tesla coils. And, you know, there's some weird speculation that he says, you know, he'd, he'd have his coil on for a couple of weeks to a month at a time and he'd shut it off. And he'd say that there's kind of this weird glow around the top of the coil and like around the whole area. Um, Eric Dollard's kind of talked about how the electricity kind of makes these weird fractal like um, burn imprints into the ground almost. Um, and so <clears throat> a Tesla coil, yeah, Tesla had his coils on and he was or saying that his coil would stay on. Um, and he turned, he came up with this term cosmic ray, um, because he thought that his coil was somehow absorbing power from something. Um, and he speculated that it was there no matter if the sun was out or not. Um, so day or night <clears throat> and Later on, what I thought was really interesting is the cloud chamber was discovered or first built, I think, like sometime in the 30s, um, 1930s or something. Tesla was out on top of Pikes Peak in Colorado um, in 1901, and he's talking about these cosmic rays. Um, and so basically, a cloud chamber was a, uh, an apparatus that's basically alcohol vapor. Um, super cooled by dry ice and <clears throat> when you have the alcohol vapor super cool basically any form of ionization will cause it to make a cloud and so I forget who figured it out but he basically started finding out oh I can take radioactive rocks and I can put them in this chamber and you can actually see different types of uh, clouds appear off of the off the rocks um, and so they brought one up to Pikes Peak in the 30s. I think it was Cal State University. Um, and they found the first ever positron clouds on top of Pikes Peak inside this cloud chamber. And all of these are known now as cosmic rays. And basically there's radiation coming from the atmosphere all the time. Some of it's got these really strong rays which we now call alpha particles. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, there's beta particles, but what Tesla was potentially talking about, you know, 20, 30 years earlier than the discovery of the cloud chamber was, um, you know, alpha particles coming from space. Um, and so, yeah, like the cloud chamber was uh, basically proof that it existed in a physical sense. You could see it. Um, so it was the first time we could actually see radioactivity, um, which, you know, really just helped along a lot of the theories at the time. Um, but it was also a really, you know, tense time because that's when there was kind of the search for nuclear energy, um, right before World War II. So, and the nuclear energy on that note, um, maybe let's, let's get into, you introduced me to the work of a guy named Paul Brown. Um, so let's touch on Paul Brown. Um, and his work with radioisotopic is energy generation. So he developed something called the new cell. So, well, I guess first to start, who, who was Paul Brown and, and what exactly is isotopic energy generation? So Paul Brown, uh, he was the first guy to introduce nitrous into cars, which I think is just such an interesting like quirk about him. Um, but he was 28 years old, uh, you know, in college, and he was questioning the nature of radioactivity. And <clears throat> he had this hunch that it had a lot to do with electricity and how, um, you know, electricity operates. Um, an alpha particle and a beta particle um, are these uh, 
two different disintegrations of matter um, that we've learned to measure. An alpha particle uh, in place of a magnet will bend to the left, whereas a beta particle will bend to the right. So there's kind of these, these opposite charges. Um, and so Paul Brown, being 28 years old at the time, uh, decided he wanted to investigate it. And there actually um, are quite a number of different patents talking about using radioactive uh, or or different radioactive isotopes um, to cause a voltage to appear across a capacitor. Um, <clears throat> and so Paul Brown started, uh, you know, doing a lot of research and supposedly came up with this thing called the new cell. And, you know, it gets into some pretty interesting just concepts because it's basically a, a form of um, you know, we have particle accelerators, right? So you can take an electron and put it inside, you know, this weird vacuum tube and you can shoot the electron out. Um, that was the, you know, the first Crookes tube, which was like a, a type of vacuum tube back in the day. Um, you can, uh, shoot these electrons and basically we know that these radioactive rocks are also shooting these electrons because we can see them with a cloud chamber. And if you take a cloud chamber and you take a particle accelerator and you shoot electrons or say you discharge a capacitor inside a cloud chamber, you'll see the same type of structures form from the in, inside the clouds. And so Paul Brown wanted to try and take these rocks that you know, for instance, um, pitch blend has uh, trace amounts of, uh, well, not trace amounts, it's got a decent amount of uranium, it's got some radium, and sometimes thorium, um, and sometimes polonium. Uh, but these are rocks that are literally like, you know, make up the mountains all around the Rocky Mountains down to Utah. I mean, this stuff is everywhere. And it's just a rock. Um, alpha particles are the most charged particles, but they can't penetrate your skin. So there's these rocks out there that are shooting these particles off for, you know, I think uh, uranium has a half-life of like 13 something billion years. Um, some of these rocks have half-lives that are older than the age of the universe as we supposedly know it. Um, and so these rocks are shooting these electronic particles off all day, all night. There's also these same types of particles raining down from the sky um, and from space, you know, from blowing up stars, pulsars. Um, you know, NASA's claimed to do a lot of interesting research, um, you know, finding out where these alpha particles or cosmic rays are coming from. And so the new cell was Paul Brown's invention that was basically slowing down the particles coming off these rocks. Um, he used a mixture of uranium, thorium, and radium, um, all of which are naturally found. Um, none, none of it is enriched. So all the nuclear power that we use today is enriched uh, uranium. And that stuff is nasty. It disintegrates into a bunch of other nasty stuff. That's why there's like cesium out in the ocean from Fukushima. Um, the type of nuclear energy that we use today, uh, we only do that because the United States thought that the Russians were doing it. And from this process that we have popularized with uranium, uh, you can make nuclear warheads and nuclear bombs from the byproducts. So we're making energy and the military is making bombs. Um, if you use any other type of nuclear energy, you don't get those nasty byproducts. And if another country is doing it, then they have the upper hand. That was, you know, kind of what the Cold War was all about, as everyone was stockpiling uranium. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, to get back to the new cell, Paul Brown thought that he was really, you know, trying to do the right thing and offer something um, to the marketplace. Uh, you know, Paul Brown's one of the only guys who's known to 
get this technology so close to the market. Um, but yeah, you know, he, he was claiming to take radioactive rocks, essentially natural occurring radioactive isotopes and slow down the, uh, alpha or beta particles coming off them and turn them directly into electricity. And, you know, he's claiming to make, uh, you know, 9,000 Watts from a battery with less than a pound of material in it. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's a ridiculous amount of power and probably a battery that could weigh, you know, with all the components and, you know, shielding and, and stuff. Um, I'd say, you know, maybe like 10 pounds, but to have something that's say 10, maybe even 20 pounds at most, um, put out 9,000 Watts, uh, continuously for supposedly up to five to seven years straight. I mean, you got truly a, a large amount of power, you know, you could hook that up to an electric vehicle and you could drive that electric car, you know, as far as you wanted to. Um, you know, if you're, if your battery is strong enough during the off times, it would just charge your car back up and you could integrate that directly with a lot of electric cars and battery powered, um, things we have today. So, I mean, <clears throat> the new cell was really an amazing contraption. He wrote a couple articles talking about the Hubbard coil and Tesla technology as basically the introduction to understanding how to slow particles down. Um, which I think is extremely interesting that, you know, Tesla coils are also particle decelerators or particle accelerators. Um, and you know, there's a lot of kind of stupid things people do with Tesla coils nowadays that completely miss what I think Tesla was really trying to describe to people, um, that there's a ton of, you know, electrical activity happening but it's happening in these these high frequency realms so to speak wow that's that's incredible <laughs> so what whatever happened to paul brown you know he developed a new cell um he was working with uh his business partner who who owned an electric company and they were trying to kind of fund it you know paul brown uh, they were in Idaho at the time. Um, there's a book about this. It's um, called The Half-Life of a Nuclear Battery. Um, but it's written by Paul Brown's business partner. And his business partner kind of talks about it from more of just a strictly business standpoint about what they went through. And, you know, basically they're approached by the military, the U.S. government. And they offered a million dollars for full rights to the technology. And, you know, they said, no way. This is this is worth way more. This needs to be out in the public. Um, and supposedly soon after that, you know, here come the conspiracy like stories, but soon after they said, no, a fire alarm was pulled and supposedly, you know, their, uh, all their information or notes were taken by, you know, the military at the time. Um, <clears throat> after that, you know, basically everything just keeps going downhill. Um, you know, he, he built the device, talked about it in a newspaper. They got a bunch of really interesting people trying to fund it. <clears throat> Military came in. They said no. After this, everything's basically just downhill. Um, they, you know, a lot of the investors that wanted to invest turned out to people trying to sabotage the company. Um, people who are almost seem to just get paid to invest and come off as like a actual investor. Um, so they had some run-ins with investors. Um, they were trying to find a good source of, uh, I believe it was strontium-90 at the time. You know, Paul Brown wanted to take the waste from nuclear power plants and turn them into electricity. Um, and while doing that, uh, he would also get rid of the nuclear waste so they didn't have to bury it. Um, you know, that was something that he wanted to do towards the end. Uh, but left and right, you know, from trying to launch the new cell battery, um, <clears throat> he wrote a public letter basically telling people, you know, if you're going to do this, you should have all your stuff together because 
you know, in the end, he was basically blocked from getting any resources he needed. Um, you know, at one point, the DEA even came and said that he was manufacturing drugs. And so they confiscated, you know, everything in his house, essentially, and his lab. And it was like a one or two year battle, which they had no evidence on. And eventually they released it all. But, it, you know, it wasted two years of his time trying to figure stuff out and basically being under, you know, scrutiny of being a, a drug manufacturer because he bought some chemical from uh, Kodak, like photography. And, you know, so he had a lot of issues happen as soon as he went public with it and started talking about it. And really after the military kind of got involved, um, you know, the end of the battery, he went to Canada and, you know, was supposed to work with, um, there's a ton of radioactive, uh, ore up in Canada and he was supposed to work with this company and he got there and they basically said he actually couldn't have access to anything. Um, you know, he moved his whole family, moved his whole life there to work there. And, you know, after a while they, they said, you know, you guys aren't helping at all <clears throat> and left and later found out that the, the guy who ran that company said, you know, the U S military got involved and he was told to stonewall Paul Brown from having any access to what he needed. Um, and so it was almost as if he was able to build some, uh, different apparatuses. Um, he gave a lecture talking about how, um, well, some of these things worked. Um, and then, you know, later on, he, he offered, all right, you know, I'll take radioactive waste, we'll turn it into electricity, and then you don't have to put it in the ground. We spent like $5 billion or something crazy in 2000s um, putting the radioactive waste in the ground. And Paul Brown was saying, for $5 million, I'll build a plant that will turn it into electricity, and then we don't have to dump it in the ground. And supposedly he was told that – you know, if he told anybody that, they'd kill him. Um, and so, you know, there's just a lot of interesting things. You know, it was a different place back then. And, you know, this story goes, Paul Brown died in a car accident in 2002. Um, and, you know, it's kind of as weird as it gets. That's frustrating. And somehow I'm not surprised <laughs> knowing the history of pretty much anyone that seems to be making any headway with energy innovations that man that's crazy um i remember a while back I don't, a couple of years ago or something i heard of um, something called nuclear diamonds i wonder if that operates with any of the same principles have you have heard of any of anything like that yeah it's exactly the same principle um there's all sorts of you know different things that you can uh yeah pull energy from anything that's radioactive you know one thing in that book uh by gustave Le Bon, um titled the evolution of matter he talks about you know mixing all kinds of stuff together and figuring out how to make it radioactive um and so you know radioactivity is kind of something that's really common it's it's uh um gustave Le Bon thinks that it's the um kind of the bridge between non-physical matter and physical matter um and i just think that uh is super interesting so like the diamonds um that's a form of carbon that's radioactive that they turn into a diamond and you know it it works as a as a nuclear battery there's there's a company right now that's selling um ones made uh Forget, I, I think it might be made of deuterium, but there's deuterium batteries, which is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. Um, you know, you can buy those like almost on Amazon or something right now. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, you know, they used to use like uranium glass. Um, thorium was used in glass to make high index um, glass so you can have, you know, thin glasses. Um, but yeah, you can use all kinds of stuff. So the diamond technology is yeah, the same thing that Paul Brown was doing. And honestly, you know, let's all watch and see if it takes off. Um, there's another company a year ago, supposedly out of Europe that was talking about making nuclear batteries. Um, 
but you know, I swear people are trying, but you know, it, it just never seems to take off. Um, there's plenty of, you know, slewed information from the, you know, oil companies, slew and nuclear. And then, you know, really this type of technology is a threat to both nuclear and oil. So, you know, it, you got a lot, a lot of uphill struggle. Jeez. Oh, yeah. And while we're kind of like on the subject matter, just out of curiosity, in our previous conversation, we were discussing your prior research with, I think it was isoelectric compounds as they apply to possibly enhancing solar panel technology. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your whole situation with that. But what, what exactly is an isoelectric compound? So an isoelectric compound, um, you know, when I was in college, it's a, it's basically a crystal that in light, it will develop a charge across it. Um, and so, you know, essentially a solar panel is a silicon crystal um, of some sort that when light hits it, it is able to turn that light into something that makes electricity. Um, so, I mean, a solar panel is really similar um, to a nuclear battery. It's just absorbing almost a different type of energy or um, I don't know if you could call an alpha particle light, but, you know, it can hit something and make light, um, which is also another um, interesting thing that kind of fits in with a lot of this type of technology. Wow. Now, uh, bouncing back to... Gustave Le Bon and, you know, in reading some of his work, what are some ways in which his work may complement or mirror Tesla's work and Tesla's understanding of the ether? Are there some similarities to be drawn there? Um, I don't really know if there's like a lot of similarities. Um, Gustave Le Bon was a really good thinker and he almost makes like no mention of Tesla. It really makes me wonder, you know, what was going on back then. Um, you know, and he also refers to the discovery of, you know, radium from, uh, you know, it was Marie Curie, but he refers to Marie Curie's husband, um, which is kind of a slap in the face to Marie Curie. Um, but yeah, Gustave Le Bon, I think had some really interesting uh, concepts. You know, he was in Europe. Um, so he was in a different place, um, but his findings, um, you know, open the door for someone like Tesla's theories to make sense um, by a lot. But he was, uh, I guess, more analytical of the classical ways, whereas, um, you know, compared to reading Tesla's work written in the same time period, Tesla is way out there. Um, Whereas Gustave Le Bon is actually talking about theory that is popular and how it relates and how to kind of take it apart and understand how, you know, there's there's more things at work here um, when it comes to the ether and also understanding uh, radioactivity. Um, so a lot of Gustave Le Bon's work was some, you know, somewhat kind of controversial because he was calling out directly um, the, the most popular ideas at the time. And, you know, those ideas still prevail today. Um, and Tesla was, you know, I'd say doing a lot more than Gustave Le Bon at the time, but nobody was, nobody understood what Tesla was doing. Um, you know, that's why still today people are trying to figure out what he was doing because he wrote about things in ways that, um, no electrical engineer can really understand unless they, you know, kind of put it in different words. All right. That's so fascinating That's so with the ether and the different, you know, people in history that have written about it. And I think there was a, I think it was Ernst Lairs who wrote a book called The Four Ethers, uh, this warmth, light, tone, and life, and that dynamics, you know, between those and, just so interesting. I, I think this is. I think it's based on the Rudolf Steiner model, maybe. Um, oh. Yeah. The more the more I study the ether physics, and the more the more interesting things I learn, and 
I love it, especially in relation to, you know, like alchemical ideas, because it really seems to validate some things in many ways. I mean, scientists like Lily Kalisco, uh, just blows my mind. Lily, she ran hundreds of experiments in the early 20s to test planetary influences in relation to noble alchemical metals, for example. And she dissolved various metallic salts in solutions and allowed them to crystallize and then observed their changes as the planets became more or less dominant in relation, relation to the Earth. And the results were actually really impressive and telling. For example, uh, during an eclipse, when the moon would block the sun, the crystalline structure of the metallic gold salts wouldn't crystallize properly. And, you know, then there's the growth of plants in relation to the moon cycle. But uh, the experiments really appeared to demonstrate how these planetary formative forces truly do shape and affect matter. And another example is the geometry of the, uh, I think is the, the eight-year planetary orbit of Venus and how that's kind of embedded into the core of like the apple and with the five-pointed star and, you know, geometries like that. Um, but I'm curious, you know, from all your research and reading into this, how do you personally go about defining the ether and its function in reality? Yeah, I mean, I think you made a lot of good points. Um, <clears throat> you know, from a logical kind of like standpoint, um, you know, the ether is um, something uh, that they used to call the imponderable <clears throat> because it it didn't weigh anything. And so, you know, from a a more analytical standpoint, there is the ponderable world, which is the physical world. So you could imagine water um, and, you know, say you have water in a cup, <clears throat> you could take that water and change its etheric properties, you know, by heating it or cooling it, for example, and you could change the state of the water, but chemically it's still water, but now it's a solid, you heat it up. Now it's a liquid, you heat it up even more, now it's a gas. It's still the same thing, same substance, um, but the ether is animating it into different, uh, different phases that act completely differently. Um, and that was something that Gustave Le Bon really hit, you know, hit on the head with the hammer was he was really talking about you take, you know, uh, for example, like potassium hydroxide, if you have pure, you know, salts and you react them with an acid, nothing happens. You need to have a little bit of water. Um, and, you know, that little bit of water allows the ether to somehow act differently. So now the whole substance has a, a completely different characteristic. Um, but the idea I'm trying to paint here is that the ether is what animates the physical world and we can measure it in terms of heat, electricity, you know, which is magnetism, voltage, um, and light, uh, including the, you know, UV spectrum and the spectrum of light that we can't see, including all of, uh, you know, an etheric vibration, um, or vibrations in the ether were known as Hertzian waves, um, or Tesla waves. Um, Gustave Le Bon doesn't mention any of Tesla's work. I don't think he had access to it because um, they're literally writing these two books at the same time. Tesla was on top of Colorado Springs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it was, uh, you know, how can you see the difference between the two? And then, you know, more of the um, alchemical or spiritual ideas of ether, um, you know, which also are supported by Gustave Le Bon. He says, when you have, you know, a colloidal, uh, you know, mixture, that stuff acts like super weird. You know, you got non-Newtonian fluids. There's all sorts of things that we found out that completely blow any chemical or like mainstream idea out of the water. Um, a lot of facts that we use in chemistry are only 
applicable during a certain um, range. Outside of that range, there's all sorts of different laws. Um, and so I think a lot of that is evidence of the ether and how the ether has these different characteristics itself and how it animates the physical world. Um, and then, you know, you have life. Um, and it just so happens that if you take, you know, for instance, uh, blood um, or, you know, the plasma or, you know, something from a living being, its chemistry is completely irrelevant of what we know of atomic physics or, you know, stuff like table salt, um, you know, enzymes and proteins and stuff in the body are so non chemically based. I mean, we have a whole thing biochemistry. Um, but you know, Gustave Le Bon's really saying like, Hey, you think you know what you're doing when it comes to mixing like acid and base together. And then, you know, you, you move more into mixtures that you see in nature, like minerals, um, and more complex, uh, yeah, mixtures of things and you have, you know, different characteristics and then you go to life and you have so many different characteristics that none of your chemistry makes any sense um, anymore. And I think that's evidence of there's more and more etheric influence as you get closer to living beings, um, which, you know, I think fits a lot within the ideas of alchemy. Um, but you can actually see it in terms of chemistry. The more you get towards living things, the less things make sense. And you have to come up with completely new concepts that have nothing to do with chemistry anymore, almost. Well, that, I think that puts it in perspective quite well. Well, we're coming up on about an hour, I think. So that was kind of a mind-blowing conversation. Um, do you have any ending notes or important points that you wanted to touch on before we wrap it up? Um, not really, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'd say the most important thing that you could take from, uh, what I'm trying to say about, you know, free energy and, you know, all that stuff. There's, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about like, you know, magnet motors and, um, you know, earth batteries and, you know, antennas and there's, there's lots of stuff out there and, really i think when it, you really get into it most of the free energy devices um that really work are based on you know cosmic rays or you know forms of uh nuclear power or just like natural isotopic energy um so yeah there's just a lot out there um and it's hard to pick through it all but i think you know that's probably the, the most important thing that we could do as a civilization is, you know, study these unknown things and, you know, really try and bring them to light because we're totally destroying our earth over oil and gas. I agree 100%. Um, thank you again, Warren. I really appreciate it. Um, that was epic and very information filled. <laughs> So um, how would you want to direct people? How can they find you? Um, you know, I am uh, going to be doing some research. Um, I have uh, alphavoltaics.com. Alpha Voltaic is, is uh, it's a type of isotopic energy. Um, but, you know, I'm hoping to do some research on that and, you know, in, in due time. But um, I've been pretty busy lately. But yeah, you could watch out for that um, when it comes to like electrical research. I used to post a lot more stuff back in the day. Um, I have a really old YouTube channel, um, Mr. Warren SK. Um, you could find all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, back then, I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't take electrical engineering. So, you know, I say a lot of stuff that an electrical engineer would probably say, you know, he's not making any sense. Um, but, you know, I figured it out and uh, went to school. But um, those are like a couple ways you could find some of the work I've done. Um, otherwise, yeah, you could follow me on uh, Instagram, Warren the Wizard. That's where I'm going to be posting my electrical research. But, um, yeah, with COVID and everything, it's uh, I haven't gotten to do as much fun as I'd like. Um, so, but, yeah, 
thanks for having me on the podcast again awesome time and yeah love being on here and chatting with you absolutely all right man well you have a good one cool thanks bye